Welcome to the Bogleheads Chapter Series. This episode was hosted by the Chicago Virtual Chapter and recorded March 18th, 2021. It features Stuart Matthews, the designer and developer of the Prolana Retirement Calculator. Bogleheads are investors who follow John Bogle's investing philosophy for attaining financial independence. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice. This is a, a, uh, one of the uh, user worksheet that's just part of the Prolana Gold uh, Calculator. And in it, I've just entered a summary of this scenario that I've built. So let me quickly step through that so you'll have some idea what we're trying to, where I'm going with this demonstration. This is just one example. It's not a trivial one, but, it's, it, but it can do far more complicated things than this. So just take it from the top. Uh, the demographics, we're talking about a married couple whose ages are 57 and 55. They currently live in Maryland, and they plan to relocate to Texas whenever they retire in several years. The uh, general inflation rate assumed is 3%, with healthcare expenses inflating at 2% above that. Uh, as far as the federal, let's see, the, the, the calculator does detail federal and state tax calculations. So the federal tax law assumed is currently the Tax Cut and Job Act of 2017 up until its sunset year of 2026, at which time it reverts back to the uh, pre TCJA of 2017 laws with uh, tax tables corrected for the for that year, 2026. The uh, initial balances of the accounts in question here are 525K in the husband's tax deferred accounts, 150K in the wife's tax deferred accounts, 225K in regular investment accounts with a cost basis of 170K. They have 10K in uh, checking and savings accounts and 50K in a 529 plan for their children's education. As far as their portfolio is concerned, they have asset classes of money markets, stocks, and bonds with real rates of return of minus 2%, 2% 5%, and 2.5% respectively. And then the allocations for these accounts are all the same. They're 60% stocks and 40% bonds until the retirement date, after which they get a little bit more conservative and go with 10% money market, 40% stocks, and 50% bonds throughout their retirement years. As far as income is concerned, he he earns 150k um, currently, increasing at three percent a year, which is at the inflation rate until his retirement date, which will be May 1st of 2024. During this time, he'll be making personal contributions to his 401k of 12.5k with a company match of 62.50. She'll be earning 40k, increasing at three percent a year until her retirement date, which is the same as her husband's. She'll be making $4,000 contribution to her 401k with no company match. When he retires, he'll, uh, he'll, he'll have a part-time job until he turns 67, and he'll be self-employed in this uh, job, and he'll earn 10k a year, or increasing at 3% per year. It also, at the time of his retirement, he'll receive a $50,000 fixed pension, which is to say it doesn't have any COLA associated with it. It begins on his retirement date, and he will have a 50% survivor option should he die before his wife. In terms of Social Security benefits, he'll earn $30,000 a year at his full retirement age of 67, and she will earn $222,000 per year at her full retirement age, which is also 67. However, he'll be delaying his benefits until he reaches 70, but she'll go ahead and start hers at 67. In 2030, they anticipate an inheritance of a 100K in a brokerage account from his parents, as well as his dad's $50,000 IRA. And then she'll do some part-time work, go a hobby and earn $2,500 a year from age 55 to 60, which will be taxed as ordinary income. In terms of expenses, they, they currently own a home, which they're still paying for, and they'll be downsizing when at the time of their retirement. So they purchased this home in 20, 2010 for 300K. It's now appreciated up to 400K. They still have a, a, an outstanding mortgage at 79,500 at 4.5%, a monthly payment of 1338. They do have a tax, property taxes, insurance, maintenance, and utilities, which add up to about 15,100. Uh, they'll be selling that house when they retire and downsizing for a house that is worth 300000 in today's dollars, and then they'll leave it 
any of their after in its operating costs will be 13.9 K. They have two cars currently and they generally plan to replace them every 10 years. They've got two children which are about to start a four year uh, tour of duty in college, which costs 25,000 per year each. And the first of those will be paid for by a 529 plan. The other would be paid on the fly. Uh, healthcare costs are being modeled here and they will be varying uh, substantially as they transition from their working years into their Medicare years. They'll start at $3,000 a year while, while they're both still working through a group insurance plan, but that will peak up uh, substantially higher when they retire and they'll go on to Obamacare and their, their, uh, their uh, premium will be $15,000 a year prior to any subsidy. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to it. And then um, eventually this will taper off as they both go on to Medicare. And I'll show you how that works. Their discretionary expenses will be $25,000 and uh, in today's dollars during their working years. And it'll go up to 35,000 in their early retirement years as they do a uh, substantial amount of traveling. And then it'll drop off to 227 in late retirement. Now, should one of them die early, uh, these expenses will be cut by 40% upon that death. They also intend some, some one-off expenses to fund the marriage of their children. They're anticipating 15K in today's dollars for their son in 2027 and 25K for their daughter in 2030. Finally, they have a charitable contribution of $10,000, which will become a qualified charitable distribution when he reaches age 70. So what I wanna do here is just model, show you how this is modeled in Perlana Gold, then do a baseline analysis of the probability of this couple uh, reaching the, the end of their expected lifespans without running out of money. Then we'll do some other things. We'll do a, a quick bear market analysis on, analysis on their plan. We'll do, we'll show a Roth conversion at some point. Uh, we'll uh, show you how they can optimize their social security start ages. I told you what ages they plan, but there might be better dates. So we'll take a look at that. Then we'll look at the uh, sensitivity of their plan to changes in, in key variables, like rates of return, inflation, uh, et cetera. Then we'll do some what if, a couple of what if scenarios, like an early death, loss of the pension. And then finally, we'll just look at uh, how the tool can deal with alternate spending strategies. What I did here was show you specifically what they plan to do, but there's other ways the tool can, uh, can do spending strategies as well. So with that is the, the scenario that I want to show you how we model. I'm gonna jump over to the, to the calculator itself. And uh, I just took a shortcut and, and here it is. This is the home page. So the calculator, again, as I said, it does not take you by the hand and walk you through. You have to think your way through this thing, but it's organized logically and it's, 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 it's broken down functionally. And you navigate among those functions by this navigation bar at the top of the page. So the home, financial assets, income and expenses functions are primarily input functions. And then the tabular projections, graphical projections, and reports are primarily output functions. And then the analysis function is a combination. It's got some inputs and it's got some outputs. And that's where we're going to find the uh, Monte Carlo analysis and the historical analysis, Social Security start age optimization, Roth, and Roth conversions, and other things. So we're going to just start off on it. It's going to walk through this thing left to right starting with the home page and walk through these various functions to show you how the scenario that I just described is input here. So again, I said this is this Excel. Um, you can see the Excel menus at the top and it's basically table oriented, but it's designed so we don't need any of these Excel menus at the top. So I'm going to get rid of them by clicking this, this link right here. It says hide those Excel menus. Boom, they're gone. Okay, we don't need them. Okay, so um, we're talking about a married couple here. So this is this is a, a toggle button. If, it were, if they were single, if, it, if uh, Joe was single, we just click that and he would show he's single. They would gray out the the boxes associated with his wife. But right now we're going to bring Jane back. So you see their names are Joe and Jane. These are their birth dates, and this uh, then the tool calculates their age based on this birth date. This is their age on January first. 
of 2021, which is the year we're going to begin this uh, this model. So basically, this page is collecting some very fundamental assumptions, such as their life expectancies, and then their assumptions relative to inflation and taxes. And I, I didn't mention up front, but the two of models, three independent, at least large, mostly independent scenarios simultaneously. And you'll see most of the pages that we're going to walk through have those the inputs for that function for that scenario listed side by side. So the, this part of the table here are the inputs for scenario one. These are the inputs for scenario two, and these are the inputs for scenario three. For a, for, so for a given scenario, the tool has to collect inputs across all of these functions. We need to give it these basic assumptions. We need to talk about the financial assets, the income, and the expenses. So each page contributes some part of a given scenario. Again, there are three. And you can name them down here at the bottom. So the, this is a short name. And whatever these short names are, it appears here. And you'll see that repeated on most of the other pages. You can put a longer description of each scenario here just for your own reference. Now, I did say up uh, on the, when I was defining the scenario, the tax law in effect is the Tax Cut and Job Act of 2017. So, and that is going to revert back to the, to the prior law in the year listed here. So it's 2026. But if you think that's not going to happen, you can change that to whatever date you want it to be. You can delete it and then in the TCJA of 2017 will go on forever. Okay, so that is basically what we do on the home page. And so with that, I'm going to move on to the next page, which is has to do with financial assets. And here you're going to see that there are uh, some some additional pages which fall under financial assets, initial balances, management, asset classes, and so on. Uh, so the, the first, and I'm just going to walk through them. I'm, I'm not going to do all of these. I'm going to hit the, uh, the ones that are pertinent to our example here. These are the initial account balances. So the, so the, the items in gray are the, uh, the account types that Perlana Gold models. So they are the tax deferred accounts for, the, for, the, for Joe, for his wife, and his joint Roth accounts. They're treated as joint by the, by the calculator regular investment accounts, inherited accounts, and they can be traditional and Roth for husband and wife. And then your cash accounts, such as your checking and savings accounts, qualified tuition plans, 529 plans, and then health savings accounts. So these are the entities that are modeled by the, by the tool, the ones that I'm selecting here. So, but each, but each of them here, contains additional sub accounts that you can that you can enter here. And these are strictly here to help you enter in your initial balances. It does not actually model these, these sub level accounts. It only models the total account here. But initially I said the, uh, so here is the, the, uh, the whatever that 425K in Joe's account, here's 100K in his wife's account. 225k in the regular investment accounts, uh, of which there is a uh, there is some cost basis here. So they so there is currently fifty five thousand dollars of unrealized capital gains as part of this 225k in these in these accounts. There are no inherited accounts as of the start of the model, and there's ten thousand dollars in the checking and savings, and there's fifty thousand dollars in the 529 for a total starting balance of $785,000. Okay, I'm gonna move now to the management page. There are a number of things that can be done on this page. The one that I'm gonna just focus on briefly is the withdrawal priority table. Uh, should we get into a situation where the couple bid model has a negative cash flow? We need to talk about the withdrawal priority. Where do we go to get the money to cover that negative cash flow? And that's what's done with this table. There are, the choices are uh, the regular investment accounts, the, um, your, the, uh, the husband's tax deferred account, the wife's tax deferred account, and the Roth accounts. Those can, and those can be put in any order. So I think that you know, there's, there's 24 ways you can arrange that. 
And those are listed here in this pull down menu. You can pick whichever one you want. And I picked the first one. That's one that actually tends to be the, the best. And then you can pick a different withdrawal priority for each of the scenarios. This table does, does other things. You can see it's, there are a number of things down below, but at this point in time, I don't think I want to go into those. I'm gonna move on. Uh, the next thing is asset classes. So uh, one thing that, that may separate the Perlana calculator from, from, um, so from other calculators, it doesn't simply ask you what rate of return do you think you're gonna get on a given account. It, lets you, it, it derives that from the ask from your under from underlying asset classes and from an asset allocation per account. And on this page, we're talking about the asset classes. And it can be as simple as a single asset. If you if you really just want to say, I just want to specify my rate of return as 5% or 7% or whatever I want it to be, I can just I can just say I'm going to just use one asset. And I'm going to just for the sake of this example, I said I, I'm going to show you how we do that with scenario three. I'm just going to call it I'm going to keep it simple. The keep keep it simple asset with a real rate of return of three and a half percent and a standard deviation of five percent. But 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 if you don't want to keep it quite that simple, you can do something else. But there are up to ten asset classes that you could enter. I personally keep it simple with with maybe two or three. This is kind of what I use. These are not necessarily my numbers, but these are the asset classes that I tend to use. And if you want to go from something complicated to just default, you can click this button here and it will load this in as a, default, as a default setting. So for this example, I've said the money market asset class for scenario one has a real rate of return of minus 2%. In other words, it's, it's falling behind inflation, but has very, a very small standard deviation, so it's very consistent. For the stocks, I've set a real rate of return of 5% with a 20% standard deviation and bonds, real rate of return of 2.5% with a 7.5% standard deviation. So, and all of these of the three scenarios uh, use the same, same assets with the same assumptions about their rate of return and standard deviations. The 529 plan, it doesn't get into the, it's not as complicated as asset classes and asset allocation, but these you do simply specify what is the rate of return you think you're going to get on your 529 plan investments and what rate and what to the standard deviation. So I mentioned earlier that the tool does fixed rate. I think I mentioned it does three types of analysis. One is the fixed, fixed rate analysis where it just uses an average rate of return each year. And these are those average rates of return. So the, but for Monte Carlo analysis, these are the arithmetic means. And these are the standard deviations, which are used to generate the random rate of return for every year in that simulation. More on that later. Okay, so I mentioned to get the rate of return for a given uh, account type, we need two things. We need the rate of return and we need the asset allocation. So I'm going to skip over to the asset allocation right here. This is kind of a, this is a busy looking table, but it's, it, but it's not really that bad, but it is organized. Here again, these are the, the allocations for scenario one. These are for scenario two. These are for scenario three. And then these are the various accounts. There's a regular investment account. The tax deferred account for the husband, for the wife, and there's the Roth accounts. And then you, so you, so down below here, let's just say we're going, so you can specify different allocations for up to five different periods in time. And in this example, I've used two different time periods called period one and period two. Period one begins uh, right now, the 2021, period two begins in 2027. Uh, you specify those years here, and then, um, and then as you come you come down here, and the, the asset classes that were you were, that you input over here are replicated on this page, and they show up here. You cannot change them here; these are simply copied from the asset classes page. But here, you go in here and you say, "These are my allocations of these asset classes." for each of these accounts. 
And for, to make it simple on this example, I've used the same allocation for every one of them. And I say, as I said earlier, during the first period of time, while the couple is still working, it's a little bit more aggressive than it will be later. So it's 60% stocks, 40% bonds. Bonds, when they get retired, they'll invest 10% uh, of each account in, in money markets, 40% stocks, 50% bonds. So now what the tool does is based on the rates of return you put over here on this page and this asset allocation here, it generates an aggregate rate of return. And that's a real rate of return. So for period one, it's 4%. For period two, it's 3.05%. Little bit, it's a bit, a little bit more conservative. It gets a little bit lower rate of return. And then here, these, these are the rates of return associated with the, with the cash account, which would be your checking and savings accounts. So it, there are no assets associated with them. You just specify the rate of return directly. So I've done the same thing. Scenario one, scenario two are identical. The one that I will show you, we'll deal with it a little bit later. Just for, you just want to keep it simple. I don't want to deal with all these asset classes. I just want to tell you what my rate of return is going to be. Therefore, we used the Keep It Simple asset, which had a rate of return of 3.5%. So you come over here and say, I'm allocating 100% of this account to that asset. And therefore, the aggregate rate of return is 3.5%, just like you specified on the asset classes page. So that's, so that's how the tool derives the rate of return to apply to each of these accounts. And it uses that in the, in the uh, fixed rate and the Monte Carlo projections. Okay, one other thing we need to talk about before we leave this, the financial assets area is the asset class taxation. Uh, and this pertains only to the regular investment accounts. We know how it's, uh, so tax deferred accounts and Roth accounts are simple. Everything that, that comes out of a tax deferred account is taxed as ordinary income. Everything that comes out of a Roth account is tax free. So we don't have to deal with that, but we do have to deal with the regular investment account. And so you have four choices of how each of the assets are taxed within the regular investment account. Could be just taxed as simple interest, could be taxed uh, like a uh, qualified dividend as a, as a long-term capital gain. It could be taxed as a long-term capital gain when it's withdrawn, otherwise it's not taxed. And or it could be tax-free, such as a, uh, a, uh, a municipal bond one. Okay, so uh, I've set it up this way to make it simple. Money markets, I'm assuming, are taxed as simple interest. Stocks, I'm assuming we get a little bit of simple dividends, unqualified dividends, taxed at 5%, but 95% of the assets associated with stocks are, are taxed only when they're withdrawn. Otherwise, they continue to grow. And with a keep it simple, I'd say it's 50% simple, uh, in simple interest, 50% when it's withdrawn. And they're all the same. So with that, I am through talking about financial assets, and then we'll move on to the income page. Again, it's organized just like the others. These, set, these sets of uh, uh, fields are associated with scenario one. This is scenario two. This is scenario three. Again, you can see that the, the name we gave with each of those scenarios is listed up here. And then here are the items that we can enter data for. This is a very long table. Uh, there's three. And for that reason, there are some links up here, some little hidden buttons that allow you to scroll from one major function to the next. So at the top of the page, there's the employment income stream. There's three of them. Beneath that, there's pension income. I'm going to click this button here. It will scroll down to bring the, it'll, it'll bring the pension uh, streams up to the top of the page. So there are two. So you can, so you can identify two pensions for husband and wife for each of the three scenarios. Now we're going to scroll to Social Security, the Social Security inputs for each of three scenarios. Um, and then there's, uh, there's windfalls. It can be taxable. There's non-taxable windfalls. 
then if you you've still got yet other streams of income you uh, need to specify, you can do that down here. There's five of these other income streams that can be defined each for, for each of the husband and wife for each of the scenarios. Going down further, you can define two annuities for husband and wife for each of the scenarios. And then if you anticipate in, inheriting an IRA, a traditional IRA or in Roth IRA at some point in the future, you can do that. And then finally, you can specify, a you can define a reverse mortgage. Now with that, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna quickly show you how I entered the data that I described for this scenario. Um, at the top, or the retirement date. I said these, these, this couple is going to retire on the same date. That's going to be May 1st, 2024. And, and they're, they're both currently working. Um, so I'm going to put that under employment income stream number one, which starts when he's 55 and it ends when he's retired. Now you can define these start and stop dates for any of these, uh, uh, any of these, um, blocks of, uh, of income stream, you can define them either by an age, by a year, by a specific date, or by the retirement date, which is here. So if you want to tie this income stream to that date, what you do is just type in an R right there. So this income stream is going to begin immediately and it's going to end on May 1st, 2024. So in the meantime, it's going to be $150,000 increasing to 3% a year, $12,500 going into uh, his IRA, and the company is going to kick in $62,50. Meanwhile, the wife, she's, it starts, she's two years younger. It's, uh, she's starting now. Her income stream of $40,000 is going to end when she retires on May 1st, 2024. That will also increase to 3% a year, and she'll be contributing $4,000 a year into her 401k. And so now I'm going to go down to the pension streams where so Joe is going to have a he's going to have a pension income stream that starts when he retires on his retirement date of May 1st, 2024. It, it goes indefinitely. It's a, the amount is $25,000 and that's fixed and you know, it does not increase, but it does have a 50% survivor benefit should he die before his wife. I want to go down to Social Security. And here I said that uh, Joe will have a $30,000 uh, benefit if he were at, at, at his full retirement age of 67. His wife will have 22 k at, at her retirement age of 67. However, Joe actually intends to work until he's 70. So this amount will be increased at, the, uh, I think, 8% a year until he reaches age 70 and it will begin. And hers will begin at the full retirement age, so it will be $22,000 from the start. Okay, um, I said that Joe will be inheriting money from his parents. It'll be $50,000 um, in a, in a, uh, um, in a brokerage, in a brokerage account in 2030. And his wife will be doing some part-time work, earning $2,500 a year from between from 55 to 60, it goes up at the uh, inflation rate and will be taxed as regular income. But you do have the option if you, if you, if you could bottle something that's not taxable or taxable as, as capital gains. Those are options as well. Just scrolling on down, uh, no annuities, but there is an inherited IRA coming at some point. They anticipate that being $50,000 a year in then year dollars in the year 2030. And it will have a distribution period of 10 years. Now, all, so all three of these scenarios are the same. I don't think I put in any differences in them. So that's how you define the income for a long ago. Now we're going to move to expenses. Again, there are a number of uh, subtables here, different categories of expenses, which have nuances into how they're modeled. And so the tool that does not simply say, um, here's an expense, here's a start date, here's a stop date, and here's how much it increases per year. This tool goes way, way beyond that. So on this page, it can be models property, such as homes and cars. Um, so what I've said, as I said, they, they currently, this couple currently owns a home. They bought it in 2010. 
They paid three hundred thousand dollars as a cost basis for this home. It's currently valued for four hundred thousand. It has a mortgage on it at seventy five thousand nine hundred at four and a half percent. The monthly payment is thirteen thirty eight. They expect to sell it in the year twenty twenty seven, and they will have a realtor fee of six percent when they do that. Uh, you can see it. So when they when they sell this home, they'll be buying another retirement home in that same year. They'll be They'll be paying three hundred thousand for it. They will be paying cash. There will be no mortgage, and they don't ever intend to sell it. And I said they had they had a couple of cars. They bought one in twenty twelve, another in twenty seventeen. You see, this is what they paid. This is what they were. They have a mortgage on one of them. These these are depreciating some every year. And when he sells this one, he expects to buy this one to replace it. When they sell this one, they're going to buy another one here to replace it. And when they sell that one, they're going to replace it with this one. So that's the, the that's the purchase and the sale of each. I mean, there's there's ten rows. You can model ten different uh, properties on this table. So this is the the top table is the acquisition and the loan and the sale information. The table below go, uh, applies to the same properties. So that whatever name you type in here is replicated here. But these get other costs. These are some costs of ownership, such as property taxes, insurance, and annual operating costs, gasoline for cars, maintenance for the homes and the cars, and then utilities. This is the, the one, this is the one page where the three scenarios don't line up side by side because as you can see, this table is very wide. It just wouldn't work to have them side by side. So they're stacked on top of each other. And so these these links here help you scroll from one to the other. Right now we're looking at scenario one. We can look at scenario two by clicking that. That now brings up scenario two. There's some click that to bring up scenario three. And in this case, they're all identical. And at the bottom of the page, there's some summary information that is that is calculated based on the inputs in the tables above. Now, and is, we're only looking at one scenario at a time. In this case, this is probably the first time we've seen this little gizmo here, which says you can click this button to specify which scenario you want, either one, two, or three. The one that's active is listed here. So right now we're looking at scenario one. If I want to go to scenario two, I just click that, and this will change the scenario two, which is the same. Okay, so this, this is the left part of the table is a summary across all of the 10 assets, and this is just one of them. This table, this page potentially goes to the right about five or six feet, uh, but that's that's very cumbersome to try to scroll. So what this this capability here just lets you look at whichever one you want. You just click up or down to look at a particular property, and this is the sum. You can, so, so on the property one, the current home, you can say here's the, the loan. It's the, they're paying that off. It's, it's going uh, towards zero. Here's the monthly payment. There's the value. You see the value of the house is going up. The equity is going up. These are the taxes and insurance and so on. And then here's the, the second second property. It kicks in when they sell the first one in 2027. And it continues on to the end of the uh, modeling period. Um, so you can see these are the annual expenses when the, when the property is sold. There's a, there's a windfall. The net expense is the difference between between the expense and any windfall. Otherwise, it's just the uh, annual expense. These are the tax deductions. And then here's the total equity. So that's basically the uh, how you specify property. This tool also does rental property, very similar, similar to the personal property, uh, but it's more complicated, but uh, that probably only applies to very few people. So we're definitely not gonna, we're gonna skip over that in this demonstration. Uh, okay, one other, one other thing. Let me go back. I failed to mention for any of these uh, any of these properties, you can do a home equity loan as well. So you pick the one property you want to do a home equity loan. Fill out the details here, and you can do a home equity loan or a home equity line of credit, whichever you choose. We're not going to do that in this example. Okay, now moving on to children, which is the second expense category, which is different from all others. Um, it basically the, the table at the top deals with college education expenses for the children for up to four children, and the table below deals with the expenses for those children prior to their college years. So in this example, we got two kids, two kids, John and Sue. 
John's going to start college this year. Sue's going to start in a couple of years. Therefore, Sue's expenses in the, in the next couple of years are listed here. They're $8,000 a year. So the cost of the annual cost of college is $25,000. That will be going for four years. The parents are only going to pick up 25% of that, though. And for John, they anticipate funding that with the 529 plan, which had an initial balance, which we already specified. I think there was $50,000 already there. But for Sue, we're just going to do all that. We're going to pay as we go. So the details of how all that lays out is not shown here, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to it a little bit later uh, when we get to the tabular projection. Okay, healthcare expenses is yet a different, um, a different uh, way of modeling an expense. Uh, as I mentioned when I was briefing the the um, the scenario, these their healthcare expenses vary quite a bit from during their working years as they go into their retired early retired years and ultimately on to their Medicare years. So. There are five, fundamentally five periods of time that the, that the tool deals with. Uh, the first of those applies, to, and all of these apply to married couples uh, in general. Period one is when the, both partners of a, of, a, of a marriage are working. Period two follows that, and that's when only one of them is working. Period three is when neither of, them, neither of them is working, yet none, neither of them has reached Medicare age yet. Period four is when only one of them has reached age 65 and gone on Medicare. And then finally, period five is when both of them are 65 and on Medicare. So for each of those periods of time, there's two rows. One, the first row deals with insurance premiums. The other deals with out-of-pocket expenses. So here's the numbers that I've chosen. Uh, for there, and then you can see when the, there is no period two because they both retire, they both stop working on the same day. So they immediately go from period one to period three, and this is consequently blacked out. At this point in time, they go on Obamacare, and the, and the premiums go up substantially. But this is the actual premium they pay, and um, prior to any um, uh, subsidy being applied, then these are their out-of-pocket out expenses. And then as, uh, as uh, the husband, go, husband goes on to Medicare, the expenses will start coming down a little bit. And then ultimately, it will go down further when they both get on the Medicare. And so the tool will, it, it will calculate the, the, it'll automatically calculate the Medicare Part B premiums for you if you check this box. If you don't check it, you have to enter them manually. In this example, I'm assuming the tool is calculating the Medicare uh, Part D premiums, you would still, if you have supplemental insurance or Part D insurance, you would need to enter those premiums here or here. Now, the, the, if you if any of these expenses are paid with pre-tax dollars, you can enter what portion of it is paid with pre-tax dollars in these fields. Moving down below, now this, this part of the table deals with Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, in health insurance. You just check if, if you uh, you want to use it. You just check the box for period three. These are these periods are the same as these periods. So if you're gonna you're gonna use Obamacare in period three, you check that box for period four. You check that box, and then assuming you are gonna use ACA insurance, this is where you put in the the uh, key number, which goes into the calculation of the subsidy. This is one. Of the, so this is the cost of the I think what's it called? The second lowest, the second least expensive silver plan uh, premium. So in this case, it's twelve thousand dollars. So your subsidy, the subsidy for this couple, will be based on this number and their modified adjusted gross income. So those two factors go into calculation of the subsidy. And there's some tables behind the scenes here, which are used to calculate the, the, those values. Another thing that you can enter on, on this table is what happens after if one of the spouses die, because these are expenses for both, both members of the, of the marriage. If one of them dies, what's going to happen? In this case, we're assuming that these costs will be cut by 50% upon the death of the first spouse. And then finally, at the bottom, if there's long-term care costs that you anticipate, you can specify, specify that down here. 
annual cost, what year it begins, and how long it goes. If you leave that blank, it begins at that age and lasts forever for the lifetime of, of this person. So that is how healthcare is done. Now, moving to discretionary expenses. This is another big table. It's got three segments to it. Scenario one, two, and three. And then disease, each of these scenarios is further divided into three time periods. With the idea being your expenses are probably going to be different in your working years than they are during your early, re early retired years and then may change again further in your late retirement years. So in this example, all the costs are the there are, I think they're the same except I put in a bigger number here for period two, which will be the early retired years, anticipating the, the couple anticipates doing some travel. So um, that number may peak up for uh, during this period two, but ultimately they get a little bit older at 2037 or slowing down again, and the number comes back down. So so this so the discretionary expenses are 27.5. Uh, for period one, 45K for period two, and then dropping back down to 25, 25K uh, during period three. And should, again, what happens if one of the partners of the marriage passes away? These expenses are probably going to reduce, and you can specify by how much down here. In this example, I'm assuming they drop by 40% after the death of uh, the first spouse. Now, now I'll go to the, another table, miscellaneous uh, expenses. Um, uh, this is generally for capturing one-off costs like these weddings. It doesn't have to be one-off, but uh, in this case it is. Um, um, John, the, 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 the son's wedding, $15,000 in the year 2027, just one time, so the start year and the, land and the second year. Uh, the start and stop year are the same, same for Sue's wedding. Uh, there's the cost. It occurs in 20, 2030. These are today's dollars, but they will be increased up to that point in time. And then uh, both scenarios use the same, the same data here. Now, the tool also allows you to model term life insurance or whole life insurance program. I'm going to skip over that for this example. And then finally, the final piece of the uh, expense inputs here is charitable contributions. In this case, I just picked one charity. The amount of 20 is ten thousand dollars. It starts this year, and increases at the uh, at the inflation rate, and it is a uh, to be treated as a qualified charitable distribution uh, or uh, donation uh, at age seventy. So, and, and again, this is for their scenario one, scenario two, scenario three. Okay, that so that completes the, the the input. I have now defined the scenario. Now we can see we can see what the outputs are. Uh, uh, Jim, is there a way for me to the, the, there's a menu at the there's at the top it's the um, the zoom table at the top is blocking my what I'm trying to get to. Like the yellow bar. Do you have a, like a yellow bar around the screen? Uh, you may be able to click it, and it may not be real visible, but it may actually work. You you can move some of those controls, Stuart. I, how do I grab them and move them? Just grab it, move it. Just yeah. drag it, yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Perfect. Okay, now we can see what we're doing. Okay, so now I so I so I mean, those are the input screens. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over analysis for the moment. I'm gonna show you the the. Um, some of the tablet or projections produced by the tool. Um, there are eight separate views, customizable views. You can define what go, what these views are and what data goes into these views. But I've got them set up and so that it's income, contributions, expenses, and so forth, over to summary. And then additionally, you can look at the details of the adjusted gross income and your itemized deductions. But let's just start over here with the income. So you can see, so. So, so these are the fixed rate analysis results. All these are based on the, uh, the, the um, fixed rate returns that we define on the asset classes and asset allocation pages. And so Joe's income is, um, is 
as you can see, it's, it's here, starts at 150 and drops down when he retires here in 2024. He only worked a partial year, so you can see it's starting to step down. Then he took that part-time job, uh, earning $10,000 a year for several years. His wife earned $40,000 a year up to her retirement date, I think in May of 2024. And then, um, and then Joe has a pension that kicks in on his retirement date here. So he got a partial year, partial, partial year here, and then in full years here thereafter. But remember, I told you this is a this was a fixed, a fixed pension. It does not increase over time. And we're currently looking at this, at this data in terms of today's dollars. If I switch it to future year dollars, you'll see it comes back to the $25,000. And then I, I think I also mentioned it had a 50% survivor option. So it, in, so at his death out here at age 80, 85, so he goes away, but now his wife is still going for several more years and this pension drops to, to a 50% of the $25,000. Okay, I'm going to switch back to today's dollars. You can see Social Security kicks in here, and this is the portion of it that is taxed based on the modified adjusted gross income or the, the taxable amount. Uh, you know, based on the AGI, that determines how much of the Social Security income is taxable, and that's presented to you here. Here's another page that shows just a few contributions. These are Joe's contributions, his 401k, these are Zane's contributions, and these are the company. This is Joe's company members. Then here's a page. Here's a page that shows the expenses. These are the the, the the this came off the expenses page. The I mean the net the uh, property page. These this came off the children's page. These are the the um, we initially had fifty thousand dollars in the five twenty nine plan, but that wasn't enough to fund the first kids' education. We had to kick in some more money, so that's that contribution is here. These are the healthcare expenses. We talked about it. It, it starts low at three thousand dollars a year, but then it goes up high, and then it comes back down again. Um, once we get onto uh, onto Obamacare, some there, there are some subsidies that are created. You can see those are listed here, and they serve to reduce the healthcare expenses here. So this takes into account the application of that subsidy. We had a miscellaneous expenses to pay for those two weddings. That's what these are. And then these are the specific discretionary expenses, which included the uh, increased spending for, for the travel during the early retirement years, a 10 year ban there, I believe. And then it drops back down to about 25,000. And then upon the death of the um, husband, it drops by 40% down to this level. Then uh, I think that, that then the final expense that we specified was the charitable charitable donations. They start off as a non-QCD prior to age 70, but at age 70, they become qualified charitable donations. And basically these then come out of Joe's uh, tax deferred accounts as RMDs, but they're not taxable. The account toward his RMD, but they're not taxable. So that is the expenses page. Now here's a, a page that shows the detailed tax information. I told you this, this tool does detailed federal and state tax calculations. And these are some of the information associated with that. Here's the AGI column. And if you want if you see this, you want to say, what the, how did that, how do I actually get it down? What are the details? You can come over here and there are the details, this page. So there's the sum, and here are all the components of it. And it's actually wider than this page. So you can scroll over to see some more of it there. And these are the itemized deductions. So should you be able to itemize, these are the details of that. And now we're going to go back. This is the tax page again. Here's reportable capital gains. These are the deductions and exemptions. Which, so there's the AGI minus this gets you federal taxable, there's a state taxable, These here's a federal income tax, state income tax, which goes away, by the way, when this couple relocates from Maryland to Texas at the, uh, in 2027, which we specified on the home page. Um, while they're still working, they got social security taxes to pay. That's this. 
And then the overall uh, effective tax rate is shown in this column. This is their marginal tax rate. Starts off in the 22% uh, range, drops down to 10%, finally gets up into the 15% range when the uh, RMBs kick in. And that is that. Now, so here is a page that shows what are the, what are the various accounts doing? We talked about those accounts initially. So there's a, there's a 529 plan. There's a cash, there's a cash, there's a cash account. There's a regular investment accounts, both tax deferred accounts for husband and wife, Roth accounts, an inherited, inherited IRA account, the health savings account. And then this is the, the total of these savings accounts. This is the equity in the property. And this is the total net, which is the net savings plus the uh, equity in the property. And so the growth over time, you see, these are the rates of return based on what we defined over here on the financial assets, asset allocations page. But over here, we said these are real. These are the real rates of return. Over here, these are the nominal rates of return, which is basically the real rate of return plus inflation. So you can see they started at 7%, they dropped down to 6.1, and that's where they remain to the end. And then these are the actual growth amounts. Um, these are the actual dollar amounts of that growth. These are in terms of today's dollars. If you want to look at it in terms of future year dollars, you click this button and then you get that. Okay, what about withdrawals? One of the withdrawals we know we're going to have is we're going to be taking money out of that 529 plan to pay for the first kid's college. And then the RMDs are going to start. They start at age 72. And that begins, so the, the age is shown here is the age of that of the, of the husband at the beginning of the year. But we know his birthday was sometime during the year. So that RMD, so he reaches 72 sometime during this year. And so that's when those are. His wife begins two years later and those are their RMDs. Um, and even though Joe passes away at this point in time, that, that RMD continues and goes to his wife. She inherits that. Um, but we do have a, a negative cash flow situation going, so there's unscheduled withdrawals from the regular investment account. I believe we must have negative cash flow. And so, yes, indeed, we do. So here's a summary page, and this is a total of the income, total expenses. This is the difference between them. This is the cash flow. It's positive while they're working, but when they you know, reach their retirement age in 2020. Or then they get it, excuse me, into a negative cash flow situation. And this is the overall withdrawal rate. Um, total property, total property. They have a loan for a while. There's the uh, property loan balance. There's the equity. Again, net savings, the no total net worth. So going back to withdrawal, we do have a negative cash flow going. Therefore, there's got to be withdrawals taken so to cover that from somewhere. And because of the the withdrawal priority that we specified back here, a uh, regular first, and then your, and then the husband's tax deferred account. It starts taking, taking those, those uh, covering those negative cash flows from the regular investment account, and that's what these are. But ultimately, I think that uh, let's see. The regular investment account runs out of money here. So now we've got to go somewhere else to get the, uh, to cover the negative cash flow in 2030. So in 2030 or 2031, we have to start taking from, from uh, Joe's tax deferred account. And that's what these are. Okay. So that's the tabular projections. And again, one other thing, if, if you don't like the way this is, there, there's a lot of flexibility here. First of all, if you don't like the way this is organized, you want it to be organized in some other way, um, you can just take that, click on that column that you want to move and go over here and move it to the left. Hmm. Move it back to the right. Move it over there and move it to the end. Put it wherever you want it. If you don't like the title that I've given it, you can delete that header and call it something else.
I just have to I just have to remember how to do it. You click the add header, come down here. Something else. So you have flexibility. You can you can you can change these things any order you want. You can change these headers that span those columns. Additionally, I told you you can define these eight views however you want them to be. You do that from this tabular projections major page. You come over to the view management sub page, and then here are all the columns of data that are available. I think there's 130 some columns of data. So it's far more than one page wide. So you do have to scroll to see all of them. But here are the age, the eight views. You can define, call them whatever you want to call them. You don't want to call it income, you type in something, change it to whatever you want to call it. And then you check which you just put checks. These are the columns of data I want to include on that page. You just go, go through, you check whichever box, whichever columns you want and it will appear on that page. And this, this, this row right here tells you whether there's actually any data in that column or not. So you can see, if it has a no, I didn't check it for the most part. So you can just go through there and pick whichever views you want. So that said, I won't dwell in on it anymore unless there's some questions, but then I'm going to, so now I'm going to move to the graphical projections. I said it, this thing produces the outputs in terms of table and in graph. So here's a, a graphical view of the savings and net worth. There's a, quite a bit of data on here. The the um, the bar chart portion of the thing of this thing is are the savings related things, and these are these are stacked bar charts. So the top is the overall net worth, uh, and so at the top, the top segment there is the total equity and property. The bars beneath that are the various components of your savings. And then the line graph is income. The blue line is income, and this line is the expenses, and they are calibrated against the, the scale on the right. The bars are calibrated against the scale on the left. And you can show this in terms of today's dollars or future dollars as well. Okay, with all that said, okay, one other thing. One of these is reports. The, the tool is designed to be an interactive tool. You make your input, you see the outputs, and you can you can flip back and forth. You can see all the all the outputs. Uh, but if you want to produce it, you know, produce a report, a PDF, you can produce a PDF file from this page, and you can arrange that in the landscape orientation or portrait orientation. It, it creates an input report, an output report. I'm not going to do it, but it generates a PDF file, and you can print it, share it with someone else, whatever you want to do. Okay, with all that said, now let's do some analysis. So based on all these inputs, how's this couple going to fare? So I'm going to start off by doing, I'm going to start off by doing a Monte Carlo analysis on scenario one. And to do that, uh, you, 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 I select this, but it, the analysis type that I'm going to do is shown in red. Right now, it's Monte Carlo is selected. If you want to do historical, you click that and see it changes to red. I'm going to go back to Monte Carlo and click update the active analysis. And it's going to take several seconds. It's going to do that analysis. There it is. And so there are there's two primary things shown here. The red line sneaking through the middle there is the fixed rate analysis based on average rates of return of each account. And then the blue bands are the Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, 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 Palana Gold does uses 500 different test cases in its Monte Carlo analysis, and the blue bands are are trying to show you the distribution of those results across all 500 test cases, and they're arranged by percentile. There are there's and they're in they're 10 percent bands. The lowest the lowest band is not shown, and neither is the highest band. So the first band down at the bottom is the is the are the results that show up in the 10th to the 20th percentile. This is the 20th through the 30th, and so on up to this is the 80th through the 90th percentile. With the cursor on there, it, it, it shows you what the percentile range we're talking about. So you can see, uh, based on the standard 
district the same the standard uh, deviation that I specified earlier. We did quite a bit of uh, a range in these in these results over time, but in this particular case, the, the couple uh, a ninety eight percent success rate uh, at the end of their life. So I'd say that's that's pretty good. Uh, Stuart, uh, this is Jim. I have a question. Yes, Jim. I noticed when you set up the original uh, assets, you put the stock market, I think, at 5% with the 20% standard deviation. Uh, yeah. Is that that's reflected here, right? That's what you're seeing, some of what you're seeing here. My question is, is I'm not used to thinking about it within the standard deviation world. Is that uh, typical or wh what would you say about the way you set this up with the five and 20? Well, the, uh, the Monte Carlo analysis is based on, it uses uh, random rates of return. It, I mean, it, what it's trying to do is simulate market volatility. And it does that by using uh, random rates of return, uh, using a normal distribution. And to do that, it, it needs to generate uh, random numbers. And those random numbers uh, are based on two things. One is the mean, the, the mean, which we define over here. Yeah, I guess my question is more, uh, how would you describe a 5% return, 20% standard deviation? Is that like the 80s or is it like the market is now? Or um, oh, I, how, how would you give people a feel for how you put that input in? Well, I'll tell you, I'm going to give you uh, tips from Bogleheads. You see this link right there I didn't mention? Oh, well, I'm sorry. I'm sharing my screen. That's going to mess me up big time. Oh, well, here it is. Did, you, did, did everybody see yeah, yeah I, we I, see I saw that. It. Yes. I mean, I, I, are you are you seeing? Are you still seeing the spreadsheet, or are you seeing the uh, Bogleheads website? Uh, we're actually seeing the spreadsheet. Oh, it, okay. it could be that you asked, you told it to share the Excel anyway, application, but you can also share your screen. I, yeah, I'll just. Um, I want to see. Actually, I, I've got a question I posted in the chat, but are there defaults for most people that aren't familiar with the recommended standard deviations or current thinking? Are there defaults built in that we can use? Absolutely. That's in this, so that's right here. I'm just going. I'm going to click it. I don't know that. I'm going. I'm going. I'm going to click it and see what it does. Um, but it, yeah, yes. And those those are the defaults. So I just clicked the load the defaults. What it did was load these three asset classes, and it used this this um, rate of return and this standard deviation. And so that the tips and the bogleheads there, um, I, I thought that was that's a that's a pretty good uh, article on the on the website there that provides um, it, it provides historical um, uh, rates of return for various asset classes, stocks and bonds and what the standard deviations have been. Um, and it also, and there, there's other pieces on that, on, that, on that web page that show what uh, they predicted, someone predicts it's going to be in the future. I think John Bogle is one of the people who uh, contributed to that at one point in time. I think his inputs were there last time I looked at it. Yeah, he's the, if you click the link, it takes you to the wiki, the historical and expected returns page on the wiki. Okay, Bob, if you want to share your screen, you could show it. Okay. Um, yeah, it might be easier. Let me, uh, I've got mine on full screen now. Uh, should, I, should I stop sharing? No. Yeah, go ahead and stop. You can restart after we're done here. Okay. Okay. There we go. I see there's a comment in the chat window that uh, uh, Joel uses 6% nominal with a 20% standard deviation. There's also somebody asking as to whether there's a silver edition available in between the bronze and gold. Not, uh, no, there is not. There, there, at one point in time, there, there was one, but there's not currently. Uh, so can you all see my screen now? I'm still seeing the asset class screen. Oh, we're seeing, Bob, that, you're sharing. That's your I'm, screen. I'm yes. my mouse. That's, uh, so yeah, if you click on the, uh, 
tips from bobbleheads, it takes you there, which has Anybody see what I'm looking at? Yes, very helpful. Okay. Thank all you. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's all. I uh, just wanted to illustrate what was happening. If you click the. Uh, all right. I'm not sharing it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay. We're we back to me now. Yeah, go ahead, Stuart. Okay. Thank you. Okay, sure. So, Jim, did I get your question answered? Sort of. Yes, I'm going to dig into that page that you guys said uh, and, and try to understand the feel for it. Uh, okay. I do a lot of statistical things, but I never really looked at it in the market. Okay. So, um, you can see there's a little bit of a yellow line showing up back there. That's because we, we did, I think that's probably because I, I clicked that uh, load the defaults and it changed the, the rates of return just a little bit. So I'm going to, I'm going to update the analysis. And, and there it is. Okay. And so that's a Monte Carlo analysis. And again, the last the, the success rate over the last 10 years of the modeling period up to the death of the wife is shown here. It's, it's, it's nearly 100%. Um, you can also show expenses, as the title is total savings and total spend. You can show expenses here as well. And it shows up, it's calibrated against the scale on the right. And there's this gray band here where the, the dash line is the, is the expenses with the fixed rate, uh, fixed rate return expenses, and the, the gray band around that is the Monte Carlo analysis. So as you earn more, in, in, in the, if you're doing well in your, in the, your Monte Carlo analysis, you're gonna, your, your accounts are gonna earn more, you're gonna be paying more taxes, and that's probably what causes the, um, the a certain amount of width in that uh, band of expenses there. But it's, I, I, I built in the ability to hide it because it lays on top of that, of the blue bands. And sometimes it can be very wide and almost cover up the blue band. So therefore, I generally run with it hidden. Um, we want to look at historical results. I'll click it and then I'll describe how it works briefly. Okay, there's a results using historical analysis. Uh, when I was, so this is using uh, historical data and I need to show you where that, that is defined on the, on the financial assets, historical data. And here's, um, so this has historical data built into it. It has S&P returns um, based uh, from Robert Schiller, go all the way back to 1871. And then there's, uh, information from, uh, let's see, the Stern School of Business uh, as the treasury bills and treasury bonds data going back to 1928. And, that's, and so that's what these are. These are the historic returns that I just described, here, the Schiller returns, these are the Stern returns. And if you, you have your own data that you can use, that you want to define for your own asset classes, you can do that with these for these extra columns over here. Um, but for this example, we're using just the, the history data that I got from Schiller and Stearns. And so the way that the historic analysis works is, this is um, it just runs through these sequences one after another. Let's, let's, so let's say that, just to make it simple, let's say I have 50, I have, let's say I have 100 years worth of history data and the lifespan that I'm going to model is 50 years. So, so the first test case I do is to do 50 years of history beginning with the 1928 data and go 50 years. So that's, that's test case one is the 1928 through 1978 data. And then for test case two, I'll start with 1929 and go through 1979 
test stage three starts with 1930 through 1980 and so on until we until we can't go any further without running out of data. So if I have a if I have 100 years of, of, of history data and a 50 year lifespan, that means I can get about 50 years worth of uh, I can get 50 test cases. So that's so that's fundamentally what this thing is doing. When I run an um, historical analysis, it uses the history data that's available. And, you, and based on the lifespan of the people we're modeling, it will do as many test cases as it can, and then it will present the distribution of results by percentile using these blue bands like you see here. And in this case, the success rate is, is much lower at only 79%. Okay, so that is the fundamental analysis. Um, let me see what I want to do, hit on a few other things. Uh, we have a question I can throw in here. Uh, uh, could you describe some of the major differences in the bronze and gold and maybe of the things you've covered so far and what you would see in oh, bronze yeah. versus gold? Oh, right, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh, bronze is, uh, is um, it's a pretty high fidelity calculator as well, but it does not do detailed tax calculations. And it doesn't, uh, it does it, um, basically specify income stream by it starts here it ends here here's the income here's how much it is this is how much it inflates per year and that's how you define income expenses is basically the same way it doesn't get on to, into these detailed uh, nuanced expenses such as how to model property mortgages and health care and college educations all that you just list the expenses when they start when they end um, are they fixed expenses? Do they inflate with inflation, change with inflation? Um, and you specify the tax rate that you expect to use, the, the effective tax rate. And um, that's what it does. It, uh, but it does generate RMDs. You don't, you don't have to specify what RMD is. It, it knows how to calculate RMDs. Um, it, you know, it does do Monte Carlo analysis. So it's much simpler. It's much simpler. It runs much quicker than this one. Um, it does not do the historical analysis. Uh, it does present the data in tabular form as well as in um, graphical form. But it's a much, much simpler calculator, uh, much easier to use. Uh, both of these have a, a user manual that goes with them, the bronze manual, probably 20 or 30 pages. The Go manual is 180 pages. So uh, you know, uh, this one, the Go will do uh, Roth optimizations. Uh, bronze will not. Um, you know, Go will um, it does detailed modeling of your Social Security. It will it will tell you the optimum age to start your Social Security for both husband and wife. Bronze will not do that. Um, so that's an overview. Does that, does that generally cover what you wanted to hear? Yes, very good. Uh, there are a few questions I could ask now. Someone said they opened up the bronze version, put Joe's age at 42, and they got a circular reference on Excel. Uh, I don't want to belabor that one, but just thought I'd mention it. Uh, OK. Uh, hmm. Okay, I think I, I'm going to guess why. I know, I know what it is. Uh, the, um, one of the things that the, the bronze calculator does is it does iterative calculations on taxes. Gold does not. And if you do not have it set up to run, it, it's possible you, got a, you have another Excel file that has come up and it's taken Excel out of the iterative calculation mode, you will get a circular calculation error every time. Because basically, it, if you do it, if Excel does iterative calculations, it, if it, it has circular references. But, it, but if, it's in, if it's in the iterative mode, it will, it will iterate until it resolves the answer. So that's how we, so, we, so the calculations, the circular references don't, are not a problem until you turn off iterative calculations. So if you, all right. Pardon me? Thank, uh, yes, thank you. Okay. Second question. Oh, um, that one. Yeah. Second question. Uh, could 
you may have covered it, I may have missed it, but could you describe anything about uh, health care uh, premium tax credits or um, subsidies? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I let me go back to that. I'm going over that maybe too quickly. Um, I think pre the premium tax credits and subsidies are synonymous. Uh, and so um, the subsidy depends on on a few things. One of which is this this benchmark cost of the the the, the silver plan cost. I, I don't I don't know if I can quote with the term. It's the second lowest cost silver plan in your geographical area. And so that's a, that that is taken into account. Also, your modified adjusted gross income. You have to, got to be between one times and four times the federal poverty level to qualify for a subsidy. If you do qualify, then the tool will calculate your, your subsidy based on this number here and your modified adjusted gross income. So the, the, the Obamacare uh, algorithm determines how much you're expected to pay for your insurance based on your your magic. And so the tool does that behind the scenes here. Yeah, thank you. I I must have stepped, I had to take care of a personal problem. I must have just missed oh, okay. that slide. So does that answer for you, Adam? Yes. Okay. Uh, do, do you anticipate making some changes for this? There's just recently, they passed some law last Thursday with uh, yes, raising the subsidy. Okay. Could you yeah, speak to I, that? I to familiarize myself exactly with what a change and then I will do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. uh, we have some questions about uh, Roth conversion optimization. If you could right. demonstrate that or speak to it. I, yes, I was going to go. I was going to get to that. I was going to use a different, uh, a different example. I, I did a Roth conversion on this particular example, but it was not very. Basically, it said eh, it's not very, it's not very effective to do a Roth conversion. But I mean, let me show you real quick. So you do, that's where it falls under analysis. And there are some sub, sub pages here. Plan Roth conversions is one of them. And again, it's oriented scenario one, scenario two, scenario three, for both husband and wife. I need to get this thing out of the way again. Um, um, and so so the, the, the input, Fields over here are for the for the husband. These over here are for the wife. Uh, basically, you can uh, you can you can either say we're, we're not going to do conversions. We're going to do. I'm going to click this button. You can do fixed duration conversions, where basically it's going to you're going to start. So this one, so there's, there's 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 three different options. We're not going to do any. We're going to do a fixed duration conversion, or we're going to do a tax bracket a tax bracket restricted conversion. So for this for this right here, we're showing fixed duration. It's going to start in a particular year. We're going to do this percentage of the tax deferred account. We're going to do it over a period of this many years, and and that's what we're going to do. Uh, meanwhile, you can, you can do the the wife can either do them or not do them also. If you both pick fixed duration, you can, she can say independently of the husband, this is when she's going to start, this is how, what percentage of her account we're going to convert over so many years, three years, whatever, however many years you want to pick, that's how you do it. Um, if you do, Incidentally, you can see we just I just did that and it changed it and it said okay that made a hundred twenty six dollar difference over the long term. Not much difference. So now let's look at tax bracket restricted. The only thing that changed here is the, the how many years you want to do it over. It's no longer a factor. It'll do it. It'll do it as quickly as it can, given the how much you can put in the. Uh, how much you can do given the limit of the tax bracket that you specified. In other words, here, we said this is the max tax bracket I want to use. I do not want to get out of the 22% tax bracket while we're still under TCJA. If we, once we get beyond that out in 2026, 
the 22% bracket is going to go away. It's going to be replaced with a 25% bracket. So you'll see the options in here have two different values. But basically, there are seven, there are seven brackets that the, the dual deals with. And depending on which tax law we're under, it's either 24% or 28%, 32%, 33%, and so on. So you can, so in this case, we've, we've said we're going to do 50% of the account starting in that year with a limit of this 22% uh, or 25% bracket. You can see the red line indicates the results of the projection, the fixed rate projection over time is worse initially, but it slowly gains ground because you're paying out here, you begin to pay less tax because you've got the money out of the, out of the, or out of the tax deferred account and the RMDs are, are lower, therefore the taxes are lower. So the Roth starts to be gaining ground. And ultimately though, it doesn't quite get there. So that's how that can be done. And then you can finally optimize it. And I'll just, and I'm gonna just do that and we'll see what it does. But when you do optimize, it does a husband and wife together. It uses, and it uses the tax bracket restricted method and tries to figure out what percentage of the count gives the best result and which tax bracket gives the best result. And then it presents it here. In this case, it's saying converting 25% of the count is best, staying under the end of the 10% bracket is best. It basically, basically makes no difference. Uh, it's only a $2,800 difference over the long term. Uh, well, another, however, that's using absolute dollars. And what we, the one thing we do know is that money in a Roth account is worth more than money that's in a tax deferred account. So the tool will recalculate, will recalculate based on the average marginal rate over over your lifetime, and it will decide how, what are the effective number of dollars involved. In this case, the Roth conversion looks a little bit better, but not, still not very impressive. $16,000 better long term. Um, so anyway, this is not a very dramatic example. I do have a, a different one that I can use that, uh, let me go, let me go just do that. But, but, let, you know, let me go just do, do that. Yeah, let me check with Margaret asked that question originally. Margaret, does that answer your question or do you have any detailed Roth conversion question? Uh, I'd actually like to see the other case where you've got um, uh, higher amounts in the tax deferred. If you have something along those lines. Yes, ma'am, I do. So let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go back to the homepage. I'm gonna go to uh, this, this sub page called Simplified Inputs. And so this is what you might use if you're just gonna, I just brought up this really complicated tool. I don't really don't wanna read a hundred page manual today. I wanna to put in some basic things like I might in a really simple calculator and I just wanna get started. I wanna kind of see how it goes. So that's what I'm gonna use for this example. So again, just 3%, 3% uh, inflation, $2 million in a tax deferred account. And in a couple that's, that's um, Already basically retired, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna tell it to go ahead and populate the tool with these simple inputs. And it's are you sure you want to do it? Yes, I want to do this. So right now it's populating those pages we already looked at with this simple data. It's eliminated everything I put in before. Put in the okay. It's, it says it's done. Now we're gonna go to the home page. And just take a quick look. Here's the initial balances. Now you can see we've got the $2 million in tax deferred, 500K in, in uh, regular. And now let's go back over here. And let's start just by running an analysis. <clears throat> let's see, you know, with no Roth conversions, let's see what this looks like real quickly. Okay, we're doing, okay, that's a historical analysis. I'm going to switch and do my problem. Okay, <clears throat> now let's go do a Roth conversion. 
All I got to do is come here and click optimize. If the first thing it does is it doesn't really know what you've already done in Monte Carlo analysis to compare to, so it's going to do that first. So that's what it just did. Now it's working on the optimization of the Roth conversion. You see in here, the Roth optimization does yield better results than not doing it. And get that out of the way. In terms of that, it, gee, it's quite a bit better this time. We're, that's in, still in terms of effective dollars. Let's look in terms of absolute dollars. Okay. So this is just counting all dollars the same. A dollar in tax deferred is just as good as a dollar in, uh, in raw in this particular graph. You can see, so the blue line is the baseline. The red line is the what if line. If we actually do this raw conversion, that's what it's going to look like. So you can see there's a crossover point out there in uh, 2043 or so. All of a sudden, now from that point forward, the Roth is better. It falls behind initially because we got the big tax bill to pay as we do the conversions. But now we're gaining ground because we have less taxes to pay because of the lower RMDs. So it goes on and gains and keeps on gaining from there on out. And one thing I have to point out here is that I think the key is that the uh, we got to, we have to have to, to get apples and apples. We got the same rate of return across all of these accounts. You could make this example look really bad if you had a great rate of return on a tax deferred, but a poor rate of return on the Roth account. But in this case, we're talking apples and apples. So you can see that over time the the Roth account gets ahead. But if we look in terms of effective dollars, it's ahead from the get-go and stays ahead by the amount of 400 and then ultimately ends $400,000 ahead. So is that a better example? Yeah, that's much better. Um, so uh, do you then produce some kind of a a uh, year-by-year chart that will show how much is being converted each year and what tax brackets it's optimizing on? Yes. That's under the tabular projections. Let's go back to um, gotta get this thing out of the way again. With goals. Here are those Roth conversions. This is the amount every year in today's dollars. There's the amount in future year dollars. Let's see, let's look at the taxes. Let's see, it said, um, let, me, let me refresh my memory here. It said the 12 to 15%, 12 or 15% or bracket. And you can see, and that is that's what it is. And out here, and out here is it, it's actually use up every dollar in that bracket in those brackets. Um, and so the, the amount of taxes. Um, so yeah, the federal income tax that it, that's. I'm going, to, I'm going to have to, to do what I want to do, i got to bring those Excel menus back to the top, but I want to use the tool to add these numbers for me. So with the Roth conversions uh, going on, the taxes pays $417,000. But if we come back over here and turn off those conversions and go back, we can see now we're paying seven hundred and sixty-eight thousand dollars in federal income tax. So that's why the Roth conversion is advantageous; it reduces those taxes substantially. And so here is what the accounts are doing. The tax deferred account begins 
Oh, I got excuse me, I gotta go back and turn that on again. Okay, we're back to that. And so we start off with $2 million in the tax deferred account. And, and then but the, 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 uh, the Roth account is coming up here. You can see it's getting bigger and bigger as we go. And if you want to do, you could put these on the same page. I don't currently have them on the same page, but you could get them on the same page with this view management. Screen. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to demonstrate that for you right quick. I think I'll put on the accounts page. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to find that those raw conversions. Let's see if I can find it. Okay, here it is. Uh, okay. So I've added that to the accounts page. Go back to it. And here are those raw conversions here. As you can see, it messed up the headers. It does do that. So anytime you add data, you have to redo the headers. For now, I'll just delete them. But if I want to put the, so you can see, there's the, there's the tax deferred account, there's the Roth account, here are all the Roth conversions. I want to move them over there where I can see it good. Let's put, let's just put all these together. So there you go. There's the tax deferred account going down, Roth accounts going up, and these are the conversion amounts. Anything else in that regard? Yeah, Joel had a couple follow-up questions. Joel, do you want to uh, explain your questions? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so I've, I've kind of built my own Roth conversion engine. Um, and what I found was sort of a mixture of things worked best in my case. So I'm, uh, I started retired at 58. So I had like five years where I could convert to a higher tax bracket and not worry about Irma. But after Irma hits, then I kind of went and said, okay, for the next 10 years, I want to convert to 22%. But for the first five years, I want to convert for 24%. And so I wanted to be able to mix and match a little bit more um, than what I saw in your demo. I was wondering, if, if my, is that capability there or uh, is that maybe a future enhancement? Partially. I'll show you what. Let's go back because I skipped over that. It will let you specify an ARMA limit. It won't let you pick a different uh, a marginal tax bracket. It will go with one or the other. I mean, it would go with only one. You cannot change that. So yes, maybe a future enhancement for now. It's only one. However, it does let you specify the maximum Irma bracket if you choose to. Right now, it says there's no limit. But if you if you want to limit it in there, so that it, so that Roth conversions don't drive your um, your Medicare costs up, you can do that. Right. Okay. It partially does what you ask, I think. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is a Roth conversions are really tricky. Tricky thing. Indeed. Um, One thing I failed to mention is that they uh, they always give respect to the uh, ACA subsidies as well. A Roth conversion will never cost you a subsidy. So it will take it right up to the limit, but it won't take you that $1 over, such that you lose that Obamacare subsidy. It'll do everything it can. It'll get right up to the edge until mm -hmm. you're no longer eligible for, for the ACA, when you, for, when you got on Medicare, for example, then it'll go ahead right. and finish the Roth conversion. Okay. And then uh, sort of the second follow-up was, uh, uh, on equities. 
and the uh, uh, the IRA would certainly be mostly bonds. So there would certainly be a difference in rate of return expected between the two. Assuming you guys are doing you know, sort of a bogglehead uh, tax uh, advantaged tax aware analysis. It seems like that would be a, a good thing to assume is uh, Roth would have a higher rate of return than your IRA. Or am I not thinking about that correctly? I'm an engineer, <laughs> not an advisor. So I basically don't go there, but you can definitely do that. If that's what you think is right, you can most assuredly do it. I did it this way. I just said, just kept a level playing field just so we could just just so, so we could just see what the right. absolute. So there's a, yeah, there's another tool, IRRP, where we have to do that level playing field. Otherwise, the analysis kind of goes wonky when you try to optimize. Mm -hmm. And I was just curious that, uh, you know, if you kind of kept it true where Roth would have a higher rate of return, would, how would that change your optimization then? Well, it, it would use that higher rate of return and it would just go, I mean, it, it would, the optimization will take that into account. So does it, uh, so what we see in IRP is it, it, it really jacks up the Roth conversions uh, quite a bit above what would seem to be practical uh, because it's chasing that extra return as part of the optimization. Yeah. And uh, so I think it might, it might be interesting to sort of, if you could quickly demo or talk to it, how it would uh, handle that. Let me do it. I'll just, well, let's just say we're going to go 100% stocks, 0% bonds. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, this was my sell. I got to go over here and make a quick change. We'll say, what do we say? 5% stocks, uh, real return, 5% stocks. Yeah. Bonds, is that good? Sure, good enough. Okay, so that gives us an overall real rate of return on the Roth account of 5% versus 3.5% on tax deferred. Right. Fair enough? Okay. Now let's go see what we can do. Um, let me just interrupt you for a second. Norman, are you saying you're um, you're going to be starting in about, what, 18 minutes? Yes. OK, we'll be done in eight. We'll make, uh, we have a shared account here, which we're using. So we got to wrap this up in 18 minutes, because the San Francisco group is going to be starting their meeting on uh, real estate. And in fact, if Norman, if you want to put the link out there, if anybody else wants to join into that one. But um, I'm going to let um, Stuart follow up here. And then I, I wouldn't mind if, Bob, if you would talk about how you use the tool, because you helped orchestrate this whole meeting. After Stuart finishes the, uh, uh, the Roth stuff. Sure. Okay, so I just I just reran that example. You can see that yeah, the difference is huge. That was a five and a half million dollar advantage in terms of effective dollars, or almost almost five and a half million dollars in absolute dollars. When you're getting a much better rate of return on the Roth account. And did that? How did that change? what targets it picked for the optimization. It went and said 90, switching 95% of the count and going up to 32, 33% on the tax bracket was the best. Okay, so it really jumped up the tax bracket and, and the amount that it converted. Yes. Interesting. So what it does, it just simply runs through all of the possibilities and then it looks and sees which one's best. and presents it. Got it. And then if you leave this page like this, that's what the model is going to assume. And all the other, anywhere else you go, 
this is this is it. So if you did, if you just want to play with it, didn't want to leave it there, then you got to go back and take it out of this mode. So right. this, just rotate between these three options. Okay. Um, is there anything other questions, or shall I uh, show you just a couple more things? Or how about Bob? You take a minute and explain your um, situation in life and why you like the tool. Oh, uh, sure. What, um, what features you use? Bob, shall I uh, stop sharing? You know, you can just leave that up. I'll just talk uh, for a second. Okay. Um, right. I uh, had initially planned uh, when I purchased the tool last in the last year to retire in June of this year and decided not to because of the good things that happened at work. But uh, I wanted to, my wife is already retired and I wanted to have confidence that we were making the, you know, I, I was under the impression from other tools that we were financially independent, but I liked uh, some of the videos that I watched about Carolina Gold. And uh, I think I've mentioned in the last meeting that uh, can I retire now? Darren Kirkpatrick is a big fan. He's done reviews of all uh, a number of different retirement calculators, and he uh, is a huge fan of Perlana. And uh, I wanted to ask Stuart, where did the name come from? Perlana. Yeah. What are, What is Perlana? Does it have a meaning or? Yeah, it's 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 uh that's my uh, great grandmother's given name. Oh, okay. I was doing some genealogy work, and I was spending a lot of time dealing with her when I started this business and I said, well, I'm just going to, I need a name. Well, I use it. Um, well, you know, I've used it because, uh, well, I modeled all our uh, different income streams. I have a pension. My wife will have a pension. I haven't taken mine yet, but uh, the tax effects of those things, social security, uh, we are, we own, have bought property where we plan to build a house. I modeled that. Uh, you know, a lot, some things that Stuart didn't show, and he modeled some things that my kids are out of college, so 529 plans aren't relevant to me. Uh, I have health insurance through my uh, retirement system. So uh, I just, uh, I, I, especially this page we're looking at now, this is something I was really concerned about because a lot of our, the vast majority of my assets are in our two uh, tax deferred accounts. My 401, uh, 403B and my wife's 401k. So uh, this gave me doing the uh, various scenarios and just playing with what ifs, uh, more confidence. I mean, I had used IORP and uh, FireCalc and some of the other free tools. And there's, you know, another, the one that's uh, available through uh, the uh, Bogglehead site, which Retirement. I think it's a retiree getting, portfolio model or something. The, yeah, right, retirement portfolio model. I, uh, that I've used all of them. They're all they all have uh, uh, some, uh, you know, just like anything have advantages, disadvantages. But I really uh, liked uh, and still continue to like Prolana. And I'll I think I told this story last time that uh, I was started using it and uh, I ran across an issue where my looked like my state tax for my pension wasn't being calculated right, I fired off an email and uh, got and within an hour, I think Stuart answered it himself, telling me, you know, basically he answered the question, but he said it was in the manual very politely. Uh, and then from that point on, I started reading the manual, uh, which has got, I mean, who, who writes a 180 page manual anymore? Uh, but any, if you wanna know something about how the tool works, it's in the manual. And uh, so I've, I've made a point of reading the manual a lot more, but um, I think I've said enough. Okay, one thing, a question came up and I think we should end this meeting in about uh, six minutes. That'll give uh, the San Francisco group about five minutes before, sorry to push against that. Uh, they've also included the Zoom link in the chat. So if anybody's interested in that, but uh, the question that was two questions for Stuart. One, could you explain how the purchase licensing ongoing changes works for in the future? Yes, it's done on an annual basis. You, if you, you, you buy the tool, I set it for $99. It's been $99 for years. I don't really anticipate changing that. And then um, 
It's, it's always developed and released on a mod on a uh, calendar year basis. So 2020, 2021 was and I'm releasing early January, as early as I can. And then I make updates throughout the year. If I need to, if I find bugs, I fix them. I fix them as quickly as I possibly can. I put out a new version. You're in if you're you own the 2020 uh, that, that year's license, you get all the updates for free, of course. And then um, I charge I give a 50% discount to upgrade from one year to the next. So if you've got a license for 2021, you can upgrade to the 2022 model for $49. And as long as you keep you keep up every year, it'll be $49. Uh, and then you get the new model and all the updates that come along with it. And I, I generally do not put out enhancements during the year. I just fix, I just fix problems that I discover or that someone discovers and brings to my attention. I fix them. And um, and the tool is, as you see, it's quite complex. There's a lot of data entry to it. It has the ability to, to export your data from one copy and import it into another copy. So it's relatively easy. It's not it's not nothing, but it's it's relatively relatively easy. Download the new model, import the data that you exported out of the previous one, and it's and it um, compared to the way it used to be, those imports and exports run really quickly. Okay, thank take, you. They take several seconds. Can you spend four minutes and talk about the study sensitivities and optimization tabs? Oh yeah, uh, I tell you what, so I. I'd like to go back to, I'm going to go back and I'm going to do what I just talked about, import. I'm going to import the file and get back to where we started from. You're going to see exactly how long it takes to do an import. That's what I'm doing right now. Okay, that's it. It's done. Uh, I'm going to quickly go over here. I'm going to do a rerun the analysis real quickly. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go to optimization. What I'm going to do run for you is optimize Social Security start ages. And this is not to say, this is the, uh, it's not going to give you the ages where you, this is, this is not going to give you the age at which you earn the most money. It's going to be the ages that result in the, the greatest savings at the end of your life. And so it's presented in this matrix. And the best answer is, this dark green box in this matrix. So that's with Joe, when Joe is 68 and Jane's start age is 65. That yields the greatest savings at the end of the modeling period. And, but these lighter green squares indicate choices that are almost as good. In this case, they're 99% as good. We say, well, what about the ones that are 98% as good? Let's look at that. Okay, there's a bunch more to pick from. Okay, so that's one. Now let's look at study sensitivities. It's this page here. So here is the fixed rate returns that was established when I ran the analysis just a while ago. And so now we can, we can do some what ifs. It lets you look at the, the effect of changes in the key parameters in the model. And the key parameters in question are the ones that are listed down here. And so let's look at so here, when I ran the analysis, it saved the setting of each of those parameters in that gray row right there. And so if I want to change those, I just click this up or down button here. So if I want to change inflation from three, raise it up, there's 3.1. And you can see that did have an effect. At the end of the model, it's, it's a, it made a $10,000 difference. I keep clicking it, you can see it's, it's getting worse. Now let's go back, let's revert back to where we started from. What about if I earn more money on my regular savings? I'm clicking it up at just a 10th of a percent, but across, across the whole span of the model, you can see what that's doing. Um, what about um, if I don't earn as much on Roth? Well, let's see. Well, right now I don't have a Roth conversion in, so if I click this, it won't have any effect. Uh, what about uh, Joe's retirement age? He's planning to retire in 2024. What do we add some to it? It's like, whoa, that makes a difference. If you work, if it works another year, it adds quite a bit of difference on the, at the end. 
Okay, but what about Social Security? I, I, over here, I just said that the optimum answer is 68 for Joe and 65 for Jane. Let's see if this agrees. 